Well, I started doing uh, political commentary in December of 2002, and shortly after, in 2003, I wrote one of my first essays at Eject, Eject, Eject called The Web of Trust. It was just as the invasion of Iraq was looming, and it was something based on what I'd seen at the late and uh, lamented uh, Steve Denbest's USS Clueless site, where he talked about the difference between two different kinds of civilizations. Uh, the Iraqi civilization that we were talking about in that specific case was uh, a shame-honor society, basically a series of small relationships where you are beholden to the person directly above you in authority, and you need to maintain authority of the person directly below you in authority. And, and these tend to form uh, tight bonds, but in a very small area. In other words, coming from that essay, as we were about to begin that invasion, uh, Den Best pointed out the fact that uh, the Iraqi army, if they wanted an artillery strike, would have to essentially go all the way up the chain of command to, um, to Saddam himself. But in the United States Army, a, a sergeant or a private, really, could get on the radio and call in the full might of the United States of America on a position. And the reason that happened was because the web of trust in a trust-based society, which is the one we live in, or used to live in anyway, allowed for a much larger connection web. In other words, in a, in a trust-based society with the rule of law in place, you can plan for the future and plan much, much, much more elaborately than you can in an honor-shame-based society because in a trust-based society, you can go outside the tribe. You can't do that in, an, in a shame and honor-based society because everybody is lying to everybody else and the only people you can really trust are the people who are blood relatives and, and really half the time you can't trust them either. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, uh, I saw something in the news uh, over the weekend that I that I found more disturbing than censoring YouTube videos. And when I say YouTube videos, I'm also including the censoring of uh, search results by Google and the censoring of tweets by Twitter and so on. Censoring YouTube and censoring communications is a catastrophe for uh, a trust-based society because it, it, it helps to rupture that web of tw trust. It cuts the connections. You can no longer have connections between people and you can no longer have a reliable flow of information. And when that information is being selectively culled, then over time, the reputation system that a trust-based civilization works upon is eroded and eventually destroyed. What I mean by that is, if somebody else is determining whether or not you can trust somebody based on their personal interpretation of a relationship that they've got nothing to do with, then you are eroding the web of trust that allows us to do things like fly to Mars or, or, or fly to Minneapolis, for that matter. Because when you get on board an airplane, you trust that the pilots are not going to bring the plane down on purpose because they have a blood feud against your family. You trust that the air traffic controllers will be awake and on the job and not drunk and asleep the night before. You trust the baggage handlers. You trust the, the flight attendants. You trust the people who made the peanuts that go into the little bag that they don't give you anymore because of peanut allergies. So you trust the people that make the pretzels. This, this web of trust is imaginably complex. And it allows us to do things that a civilization like ours is, is capable of doing. But when you start messing with the connections between any two nodes, when you start selectively cutting them, when some outside force starts determining who gets to hear what and so on, you start to really damage the, the web of trust. And parenthetically, you might ask yourself, what is it that they're so afraid of? That's an entirely different question. But censoring information is the second most damaging thing that you can do to the web of trust. And over the weekend, I saw a great example of the single most damaging thing that you can do to the web of trust. What is the single most damaging thing you can do to the web of trust? Well, here's the story. It's from newsbusters.org, and the headline is, Shocker, YouTube CEO accepts free expression award from an event her platform sponsored. And it reads, YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki, and apologies to uh, Susan and to any other Polish Americans, that's the best I can do with it, 
accepted an award for freedom of expression a year after unprecedented censorship of conservatives. After an unprecedented year of YouTube censorship, the Freedom Forum Institute, haha, a group which states that its mission is to foster First Amendment freedoms for all, has given YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki a free expression award. The Freedom Forum's official website listed YouTube as the top-ranking signature sponsor, meaning that Wojcicki accepted an award at an event that her company funded. Wojcicki is quoted in the event's promotional video explaining, quote, I also really care deeply about the freedom of expression and the fact that people all over the world can use it to tell their story, unquote, as the video cuts to footage of liberal activist commentators. Let me explain in a minute why that's worse than censoring information, but as a small aside built into the article, a small ray of hope here. Apparently, the YouTube community has hammered the video for hypocrisy. The comment section was a dumpster fire with users roasting the platform. The video has a pitiful seven upvotes compared to a whopping 2.5 thousand downvotes at the time of publication. Undoubtedly, comments will be closed if they're not closed already, and, and the upvote, downvote will be erased as well, and maybe the video will be pulled, but we'll come back to all this in just a second. Let's just finish up what's in the article here. The video included an admission that YouTube, quote, removed 9 million videos last quarter, and almost all of them, over 90%. We removed with machines, which is good, because it means that if there's content that's violative, we find that really quickly, unquote. Such an admission seems to run counter to the notion that YouTube is in favor of freedom of expression. The article goes on to point out that the so-called Freedom Forum's interviewer, despite the organization's name, asked Wajiki about her commitment to, quote, protecting our community from content that can be harmful, unquote. Yes, that's the first question that I would ask if I had an organization called the Freedom Forum. What freedoms must we give up? Uh, in order to make sure that nobody's feelings are hurt by this, the Freedom Forum. We'll get to that too. It's all part of the. It's all part of the same dynamic. But here's the last. Here's the last sentence. What Shiki responded that the mere presence of controversial material, such as quote hate content, dangerous content unquote, in the past, made YouTube quote no longer a platform that was viable for all of these other voices out there unquote. Let's work our way up on this one, shall we? Because it's a really pretty simple issue. First of all, for this person to be receiving an award uh, celebrating freedom of expression and have the video presentation of that award brag that 9 million videos were pulled down by machines is not figuratively Orwellian. The term literally is the most overused, well, it's literally the most overused term in our, in our society today. But in this particular case, it is literally Orwellian. Because in 1984, George Orwell talks about how you control people's minds, and the way you control their minds is you control their language. And in 1984, it was one of the most chilling scenes in there. I find it more chilling than the scene with the rats, frankly. Winston Smith is at a cafeteria having uh, lunch, uh, algae paste, sustainable, um, with a colleague who's working on the Newspeak Dictionary. And the person who's working on the next edition of this dictionary is astonishingly pleased that the dictionary contains, I forget the number, 60,000 fewer words than in the last edition. In other words, they've been able to eliminate 60,000 words, and isn't that great for Ingsoc English Socialism? Well, it is. They're proud of the fact that they're reducing the vocabulary, because if you have no word for freedom or rebellion or anything, how are you going to think about it other than to think of it as double plus ungood? So for her to be saying that it's a grand thing that 9 million videos were taken down, and taken down by machines, by machines, because it's faster that way. This defies parody, sarcasm, snark, or anything. It, it, it's, it's, simply, it's simply beyond my ability to, to mock or, or, or to despair over. It just simply is what it is. Here's a person receiving a Freedom of Expression Award bragging about the number of free expressions that her company has destroyed. There's also in this mix the entire idea of the award being given to themselves, being issued by, um, by an organization called the Freedom Foundation. Uh, 
how often do we see this today? Um, uh, the latest Democratic Party bill designed to stifle any disagreement with the policies of, of Joe Biden or whoever Joe, Biden's, uh, uh, Joe Biden is, uh, is called the American Freedom of Expression uh, Bill. And, and, and all of the rest of this kind of, of, of Sovietization of language, this, this constant, constant, constant wrapping of, of tyranny and oppression and destruction of rights in things like the American Fairness Act and the Freedom of Voting Rights Act and so on. And if you want to see how these people respond to things like genuine attempts to restore trust, that web of trust, all you have to do is look at the reaction to Georgia. Georgia decided to try and put some fairly minimal safeguards into making sure that the people who were allowed to vote voted, and the entire left mobilized against this deadly threat. Pulled out the Major League Baseball games and the whole thing. We've been all over that. But what is it about Georgia's voting laws that's so terrifying to them? Well, what's terrifying to them is the fact that these laws are designed to increase trust, you see? And that strengthens the web of trust, and that's bad for people who want to use these strings to control other people. But none of this is really the point. So why don't we get to the point? What is it about YouTube receiving an award for freedom of expression that is worse than them actually censoring videos? Well, it's actually pretty simple. When seven people give that video a thumbs up, and they probably all seven of them work for YouTube, and 2,500 people give it a thumbs down, that's an indication, it's solid evidence, it's not up for discussion, that everybody out there knows that this is a lie. Everybody out there knows that this is a lie. If it turned out that the thumbs up, thumbs down were reversed, we'd be in an even worse situation because that meant that people were really buying the lie. But this is where the web of trust is destroyed, you see. When lying becomes so obvious and so blatant and so shameless that anybody looking at it realizes that this is just simply not only not true, but an event designed to manipulate your opinion. Now we're at the end of civilization and we're at the end of the web of trust because now we not only see information being removed from the web of trust, now we see false information actively pumped into the web of trust. This is obvious to everybody and unlike what these idiots actually think the result will be. Like this is somehow going to raise YouTube's uh, stature. Well, we gave ourselves an award. See, we're not censoring people. We've just given ourselves an award for freedom of speech from the Freedom Foundation, no less. And of course, one of the things we brag about is all the videos that we've taken down. When people see that and the people that put on this event must think this is restoring YouTube's credibility. It's, it's, it's not. It's making it much, much worse. And the reason this is fatal to the web of trust is, and here is the entire point, when you no longer can trust the connection between you and people you don't know, when you no longer believe the news, when you no longer believe in the law, when you no longer believe in law enforcement, when you no longer believe in justice, when you no longer believe in any of these things that have been actively destroyed by the left, when you no longer believe that what you're seeing on the news is even approximating the truth, when everybody knows that this is fiction, when, when you no longer believe that the nation's premier law enforcement agency is no longer a law enforcement agency. It is a tool of oppression and a tool of political assassination, in the, at least in the reputational sense, so far. When the FBI is involved in bringing down a president of the United States of America, when all of these things are so obvious to everybody, then you no longer are willing to trust people beyond your immediate circle. And all of the benefits of, of a Western civilization that are predicated on trust rapidly begin to dissolve. How can I trust an airline pilot that I've never met before? I'm extrapolating, but I'm not extrapolating far into the future. How can I trust that this guy is not going to crash me and my family and my loved ones in the airplane into the side of a hill? Well, prior to this kind of thing on the part of YouTube and Google and all the rest, prior to the censoring of information and then, and then prior to the injection of known lies into the system, I would be able to say things like, well, 
the guy has obviously had to pass a test licensing federal government has has, has, has reviewed the safety standards and, and as a pilot myself I know that currently this guy had to have a lot of training had to pass a lot of tests he had to be certified by the FAA but if I no longer believe in the FBI and I don't then why should I believe in the FAA why should I if this person can get an award for freedom of expression bragging about how many videos she's pulled down then who's to say that uh, the pilot of the airplane isn't Hunter Biden. And I mean that essentially, if you'll pardon the expression, literally. How do, how do I know it's not Hunter Biden? If Hunter Biden can commit these kind of crimes with this kind of evidence, it just skate away, then how do I know that I'm not riding in an airplane that Hunter Biden decided he wanted to fly. He wanted to be an airline pilot today. How do I know? It may sound ridiculous, and I am exaggerating it for the sake of the, of the point. But seriously, how would I know? If he can get away with anything, how, how would I know that he's not flying the plane or somebody like him? How would I know that the pilot on the plane that I'm about to take off in didn't get the job because of competence and rigorous standards and an infallible legal system designed to apply standards to every single one of these pilots, how do I know that this guy just isn't related to Nancy Pelosi and is therefore the captain of the 747? How do I know? I don't know. And when the web of trust is destroyed, well, the eventual consequences of this are I just won't fly anymore, and neither will anybody else either. And we won't fly anymore, and we won't start businesses anymore. We won't innovate anymore. We won't invent anymore. We won't trust each other anymore. We won't like each other anymore. We won't enjoy each other's company. We won't go to football games or baseball games. We'll do exactly what they want us to do, which is remain in our house, connected by video links that can be controlled by them, just like the TV set that looks both ways in uh, 1984. And slowly, slowly, slowly at first, but then very quickly, that web of trust is going to shrink and shrink and shrink. It's shrinking already. Now, this is the world that the left has in store for us. It's not just a world where the trust of information is no longer there. It's a world that they are aggressively and they are passionately and rapidly enforcing a sense of tribalism upon. In other words, in addition to this acceleration that I can no longer trust the information from people I don't know and therefore I can no longer trust them, we're also being rapidly told that your entire ability to trust someone is predicated on the single most tribal aspect of human civilization, and that is, do they look like me? How can you trust this person to talk about history? He's a white guy. He's obviously lying. This person, on the other hand, who's a lesbian, transgendered lesbian of color is an inviolate authority because of their high victimhood status. So the final question is, well, what do you do about it? Uh, I don't see, let me put it to you this way. If I were in charge of YouTube tomorrow, which I would consider to be a fairly unlikely event, but if I was, I could begin to take measures to restore that trust, but that trust wouldn't be restored for years and years and years and years and years, and that's not going to happen. We all know it. So what do we do? Do we go back into a world of, of tribalism and a, wor a world where we only trust the people that we know personally and all of this magic disappears? I'm not going to drink this water. What do I know about the guy who works in the water purification plant? Do I know that he's a member of my clan? then no, I'm not drinking the water. You, you see where it goes. So that's one alternative. The other alternative, shy of returning everything to a sense of trust and, the, and restoring the web of trust, is to essentially say to ourselves, okay, we're going to have to make a smaller web of trust. We're going to have to understand that this thing that we've taken for granted for so long has been so badly compromised now that we no longer trust it, and it's going to get worse. And rather than return to a tribalist, brutal, uh, fearful, unhappy, absolutely fun-free existence, like the rest of the world generally has enjoyed for the history of the human race, we're going to have to establish our own web within the web. We're going to have to establish that these people 
that are joined together by philosophy or by whatever are in fact fundamentally trustworthy, fundamentally virtuous people, and why I can no longer trust everybody as I used to, I can at least now trust these people who identify with this set of principles, who believe in the rule of law, who believe in the idea of objective truth, who believe in the idea that just because something feels good doesn't mean it's true. All of these values, we're going to have to learn how to identify each other by these values. And that means we're going to have to find a way for us to be able to demonstrate to people that we don't know that we're trustworthy and that we're not part of this ongoing closing down of, of trust, this ongoing darkening of the light of information, this ongoing suppression of truth, and this ongoing disgraceful and disgusting celebration of something that every single person knows to not be true. This is how the Soviet Union fell. It didn't fall because of, of arms, and it didn't really fall because the people didn't want communism. It fell because on a daily basis, every single Soviet citizen Every single one of them was lied to on a daily basis, and that's bad. But what's worse and what was ultimately fatal for them was that they knew that they were being lied to on a daily basis. They knew it. And when you know that everybody's lying to you, the only people you trust are the people you can trust.